and welcome to our first K-14 Health Sector Discussion Forum. This is our first one. So thank you for being a part of this um, monthly forum. We are hoping to bring these to you monthly to invite um, our industry partners to share with you as well as share some great ideas, um, let you discuss ideas in your teaching, um, and also to join those of you that are community college educators and the K-12 educators together in one place. So welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, we have this fun little word search on the screen. So um, thank you for those that are dropping in your answers into the chat and here are the, here are the answers. So there are quite a few there and I think we have a winner with the last name Loggins, perhaps. I think uh, won the most words, so thank you. Uh, oh. so <laughs> Oh, woohoo! And where are you from? What school or district? Uh, Alhambra School District, San Gabriel High School. Welcome. Thank you. Great. Alrighty. So with that, um, if everyone could, um, before we get started, if just a couple housekeeping items. If everyone could please keep your, your mic muted, except for those, of course, who are presenting, that would be so helpful. Also, if you'd like to turn in your camera, feel free to, you don't have to, but it's always nice to see everybody. So you're welcome to uh, turn on your camera, but please, if you don't mind, keep yourself muted. We will have a chance, an opportunity for you to enter your questions, um, a Q&A session and enter your questions in the chat, which then I will help facilitate those questions with the presenters. Um, because there's so many of us on the line, there's about almost 40 of us now, it, it'll probably be easier to enter in the chat, but don't worry, we'll prompt you at that time. Um, but uh, feel free if you'd like to chat, um, enter something in the chat as we go along, and we will get to the, your questions as soon as we can. So with that, I would like to welcome everybody. Again, this is our first K-14 Health Sector Discussion Forum. And I am Heather Cavazos. I'm a coordinator. Uh, I work for the San Diego and Imperial Counties Community Colleges. I coordinate work-based learning for uh, middle school and high school students that tie to the community college programs all around career education. And I also um, provide professional development for educators in the region. And then we have Connie LaFuente with us who can introduce herself. Thank you, Heather. This is Connie and welcome everyone. This is very exciting. It's our first uh, discussion forum. So uh, we're very, very excited. And thanks to Heather, she's a wonderful collaborator. Uh, my name is Connie Lafuente. I'm the Regional Employer Engagement for the Health Sector for San Diego Imperial Counties. And I'm responsible for fostering communication and collaboration. Okay, okay, okay. Partners. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, okay, for engagement. Oh, I think we need to meet some people. <laughs> Um, and through employer engagement, I assess the workforce needs and I share that information with our community colleges um, so they can respond effectively to the changing workforce needs. And additionally, I work with in cross-sector collaboration with other regional directors on different initiatives as well as statewide with another regional directors throughout the state on statewide initiatives, faculty development, incumbent worker development and uh, many, many other things. So with that, I just wanna say welcome and thank you, Heather. Thank you, Connie. I also wanted to mention that I do have my colleague, Monica Rosas on the line. Monica, if you could give a quick wave. Uh, she does the same thing that I do, but just for different um, focus on different industry sectors. And she's gonna help monitor the chat today. Um, so moving along, uh, here is the uh, agenda for today. We do have a special guest that will join us in a little bit. This is Kirsten Canali with Scripps. She's the Director of Talent Acquisition and Talent Development at Scripps Health. And um, what we're going to do is, is first go over just a few resources. Connie and I will do that. Um, health sector resources uh, that are for the region for K-12 as well as community college educators. And um, Connie then will present her regional health sector profile analysis. And hopefully if we have time, there'll be some time to ask some questions for Connie. And then we'll jump into Kirsten's presentation. Again, if we have time after her presentation, we can ask questions, but we actually did build in some time here at the end, oops, to ask some questions. Um, and then we will cover uh, 
we will do a closing at the end. This hour is going to go by super fast where we'll throw out a survey link to find out what you would like to learn or hear more about for the discussion forums moving forward. Okay, so, um, but before we go into that, I wanted to just launch a little poll to see, um, let me just go here one sec. Nathan. Let's make sure we're muted if um, you don't they've mind. They've already gone past the college, it's only 45 minutes. One second here. Here at the labor market research reports. Oh, well, whatever. Trying to mute one second here. I think you can mute Ellen. Um. And then the one on the right is called 21st Century Employability Ellen, if you could um, mute yourself, that would be so helpful. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so before we get into it, I'd like to. Um, do a quick poll. Are you a K-12 educator or a community college educator or maybe other? So here is the poll. Can you guys see it on your screen? If you could take just a few seconds yes. to fill this out. Thank you, Monica. Just kind of get a gauge of who's in the room here. Okay. And with that, we'll end polling in five, four, three, two, one. Great, so here are the results. Excellent. So we have about 48% of um, mostly probably I'm thinking high school health pathway or educators, but maybe some middle school are on the line. Uh, community college educators as well, 17%. And then we have other which are made up of maybe deans or associate deans at the community college level, administrators or CTE staff or CE staff at the colleges um, or even at the, co uh, the high school districts. And those could be anybody from the support staff for CE, uh, work-based learning coordinators, job placement, case, case managers, um, our career center folks. So we invited everyone to join. So thank you for this. This just helps us to know who's here. So we appreciate you coming today. Were you all able to see the results? Yes, okay, great. All right, so with that, Connie, I'll let you go through the resources. Okay, thank you, Heather. Um, I just wanna share with you some very, very useful resources that you can access um, and there's great information. And just very briefly, I'm gonna just mention them and then we're gonna go and just take a quick look. Um, so one is the Health Workforce Initiative, Exploring Career um, Healthcare. So if you go into that link, you will find several types of resources, uh, which in anywhere from curriculum. And if you can click on curriculum really quick, Heather, I wanna just bring up this high touch healthcare, the critical six soft skills, because I'm gonna make reference to that. And this is a great way to kind of look into all the resources available to be able to share these with your students and help them um, be better communicators um, and learn these skill sets that are very much needed in our um, healthcare sector. So, never mind. So there's another um, section there, it's also the career pathways, and there is a career, uh, a beautiful um, catalog of different, different career paths that you can share with your students. And this one is the Centers of Excellence. This is a great, um, this is the research arm of our community colleges, and they provide labor market research to community colleges for high growth and emerging occupations. And they are, they're divided by different sectors and regions. And you can actually gather information on great reports about sector recommendations, um, also about uh, resilient jobs during the recession and uh, COVID, 19 pandemic era and so on and so forth. This is great for research and uh, all these information will be provided to you also on an email after this. The other one is the sector brief for patient care coordinators. This is the research that was done and this is what I will be presenting on. So I wanted to share the entire sector brief with you and um, you will also get that after the presentation. 
And we're going very quickly through this because um, we, we don't want to spend too much time. This is really hot out of the oven. This just came out this past week. Uh, we are partnering with US Learns to be able to provide the new skills for nurse assistance course. As you can probably, um, probably have a lot of students that are struggling with the English language or they need to sharpen their vocabulary, communication or listening skills. And this is a great site that they can practice those. And you can also use these as assignments. There are several different modules that you can um, access to be able to um, enhance your coursework or enhance anything you're doing in the classroom. Then we have the San Diego and Imperial Counties Career Education website. And uh, this is another great site where you can actually see all the different colleges and the different health programs that are offered under each college. So if you click under the little um, uh, class sign right there, Heather, then you can see, for instance, in Imperial Valley that they offer all those different um, training. Thank you, Heather. Then, and the last but not least is the labor market information handout, which is a, a one pager handout that you can use that provides very succinct information about the health sector. And it looks just like that. And this is a great one sheet for um, students students and parents, very easy to understand, has a little bit of labor market information um, without getting too complicated, samples of locals, employers, and then just kind of like some of those, what are, you interest, what are your interests to help tie those to these careers? This is a great resource too. You know, um, these different jobs, these different careers, and what is the hour, hourly and salary rate um, for these jobs? And then of course, encouraging students to explore and parents, you know, uh, resources such as California Career Zone or different kind of exploration resources, career exploration resources. Thank you, Connie. You're welcome. And with that, um, what we'll do is now, um, and again, Connie said, you know, she mentioned these, these resources will all be provided in the recap link afterwards, so you'll have those. Um, and we also just wanted to touch on a few resources through our San, Di San Diego County Office of Education, um, which are mostly for our K-12 educators. I'm sure many of you have seen these resources, but there's an endless amount of resources um, around the CTE programs, um, lots of uh, work-based learning recordings, there's the CTE instructors network, um, you know, all these different resources here that you can click on um, that will give you some access. Here are the different uh, work-based learning recordings, virtual, while we're doing virtual interactions around all of the different sectors. Also, they have a Career Pathways Navigator newsletter link and then joining the CTE Instructors Network, which many of you probably are part of if you're uh, a high school teacher on the line. So um, we just wanted to provide these to you. Again, these will be available via a recap email and we'll make sure to include all of these links so you'll have all of these. Okay, and with that, now I'd like to take it back to Connie LaPuente um, to talk about her regional health sector profile analysis, which is really interesting because it gives you a really good look into what are the needs, what are the demands um, that uh, industry is experiencing during these changing times. And, and just a little bit about Connie, she's um, bilingual, bicultural public health professional. She has 20 years of experience in public health, so we're really happy to have you join today, Connie, and share your profile with us. So with that, I'll go ahead and stop my share. And Connie, if you want to bring up your presentation. Thank you, Heather. Yes, if you can stop, then I can share. And while Connie brings that up, I just want to re reiterate, we appreciate everyone attending today. We hope you enjoy this. And don't forget when I post the survey link at the end to um, add to that so we can make sure moving forward we cover the topics you'd like to hear about. Okay, Connie, thank you. Okay, can you guys see it? Awesome. Yeah. Great. Uh, let me, hold on. 
Well, first of all, I want to welcome again everyone, and I'm very excited to share this information with you. Uh, it's being a collaboration with the Centers of Excellence with a colleague, colleague of mine, Tina Nobartel, as well as Kevin McMacken. And I just want to make sure they receive credit as I provide this presentation. I did see some familiar faces, so I apologize for the repetition, but maybe um, uh, it will trigger some new questions. Um, anyhow, so here we go. I will be speaking with you today about what is the health sector, the methodology, trends, and recommendations. And as most of us are in the health sector, we probably know most of this information, but just really briefly, the health sector um, accounts for 136,000 jobs in the San Diego Imperial region. There are approximately 8,000 establishments in the region, making up 9% of California's healthcare businesses. This sector is projected to grow by 15% in the next five years, and healthcare is considered a resilient factor. Sector, I'm sorry. Um, there are when we talk about the health sector, a lot of people think of just nurses and doctors, but in fact, there are over 48 occupations under all these main categories. Those 48 plus programs are being taught throughout our community colleges. For, is, for instance, under the nursing category, we have certified nurse assistants, home health aides, licensed vocational nurses, under, under emergency medical services, we have emergency medical technicians, emergency medical responders, paramedics, um, uh, firefighters, et cetera. Uh, in the last 10 years, the population in San Diego County has gone up and continues to grow. Um, from 2009 to 2019, we see that it grew by 10% from 3.1 million to 3.3 million. And SANDAC predicts that the number will increase to 4 million by 2050. During the same time period between 2009 and 2019, the aging population, 55 plus, has grown by 33%. And by 2029, it is projected that the population of 55 plus will be over 1 million. Similarly, in Imperial County, there has been a similar trend in the last 10 years. Uh, the population grew by 6.5%, and the aging population has grown by 28%. It is important to note that the older population is growing at a much higher rate than the rest of the population. In both counties, the 55 plus population tripled the rate of growth from the current population. This means that as the aging population increases, the greater will be the demand for healthcare services and for healthcare workers. Um, in regards to the methodology and research we used, um, as you can see, there are five different um, uh, tiers. And the um, Centers of Excellence, which is the research arm for the community colleges, began this process in 2018 by identifying top occupations with supply gaps and sharing those recommendations with the community colleges. In 2019, 2020, the regional directors review the sector analysis reports and interview survey employers for more information. During that same period, the regional directors requested more research from the centers of excellence based on the analysis and information they received from engaging those employers. And that led into preparing the sector recommendations and working collaboratively with the centers of excellence we produce these sector recommendation reports. And currently we are in this area, the gray area where you're sharing and receiving feedback. So now we are sharing these recommendations with our workforce development council and industry groups panels. And of course with you to receive some feedback. Yeah. So the sector recommendation brief looks like this. Yeah, this is the research part that assess the in-demand jobs, skill sets, and emerging occupations. Okay. Part of the okay. research included um, a list of ed education entities that offer most, um, th that offer programs for these most in-demand jobs, like no. for health aides, medical assistants, and certified no, assistants. 
we have six community colleges that offer programs and there is 11 private um, community colleges that also do the same. It also includes the labor market demand versus the, mar versus the labor market supply. As you can see, there's the supply gap of 1,019 occupations in San Diego County. And uh, the research also mentions the hourly earnings and the median hourly earnings for these uh, foundational occupations, which as you can see, the entry level earnings are below the living wage um, for a single adult in San Diego County. So it's below $15.99. The medium hourly earnings, uh, they're a little higher. However, they still fall under the minimum living wage with exception of the medical assistance. So we're not paying enough to folks that are doing these jobs. So in addition to the research arm, we also conducted, I conducted um, stakeholder interviews and a focus group. This is a sample of healthcare facilities that I engage to validate information it is important to mention that some of these healthcare centers are large networks, such as San Ysidro Health Centers, for instance. They have 42 program sites, and Family Health Centers has over 23 clinic locations throughout San Diego County. That means that I met several key leaders in each of these sites, sometimes between six or eight, um, to, with the purpose to validate the market supply, gaps, opportunities, assess training needs, and identify essential um, knowledge, skills, and abilities for those occupations. Additionally, we discuss the, uh, the in-demand occupations, emerging occupations, and, and opportunities for work-based learning, clinical placements, internships, and externships. Um, I also invited them to be part of panel interviews. And once I collected all this information, I reported that back, and I worked closely with the Centers of Excellence with Tina, as well as with my counterpart, Kevin, to be able to assess um, what were the main needs. And over and over again, as I conducted these stakeholder interviews, I keep hearing the great need for patient care coordinators. So uh, we conducted a focus group with 11 patient care coordinators. And these focus groups, uh, individuals came from all the clinics that you see here highlighted in yellow. And we also had representation from Imperial Valley and El Centro. So what are these patient care coordinators? Here are some of the job duties and functions, but primarily they facilitate communication between patients, family members, medical staff, administrative staff, social service organizations, and other healthcare providers to ensure that the patient receives the medical care that he or she needs. They're familiar with community services and resources available to patients, and they refer patients to appropriate healthcare services. Uh, patient care coordinators also train and educate patient, families, and social service providers. They work in ambulatory care settings, such as clinics, and nonprofit organizations, hospice facilities, insurance companies, large dental offices, long-term facilities, et cetera. And some of the required job duties are here, but due to timing, I'm only gonna reference to a couple of them. Meet with patients and families regarding treatments, procedures, medications, and continuity of care. Assist care team with setting goals for quality assurance best practices provide community resources and referrals for community of care, and assist in locating funding for special procedures or other patient needs. So basically the, they serve as the liaison so these patients can get the care that they need. Since um, this is an emerging occupation, there were no SOC codes. So CODES stands for Standard Occupational Classification, which is a federal um, statistical standard used um, to classify workers into occupations. So we didn't have any SOC codes, and there were also no top codes. And top codes are used at a state level uh, by community colleges to, con to collect and report information on programs and courses. So more research was needed. So the research entail going back and looking at 
all these. So what we found out through research again was that these occupations actually uh, patient care coordinator earn above the li minimum living wage uh, as an entry level, as well as medium, as also as experience. So experience almost earning $30 an hour. In terms of labor market research, uh, also we looked at the number of job postings for patient care coordinators. And as you can see, between 2010 and 2019, it increased from 574 to 2,565 in San Diego County. And we're still working on the Imperial County numbers and we will report that next. But um, right now, for the purposes of this report, we, we were focusing primarily in San Diego County. And then we also looked at care coordinators because a lot of these positions were posted as patient care coordinators or care coordinators. And as you can see, there is also uh, demand under that job title. So currently in the workplace, the patient care coordinator occupation is above the medical assistant, medical secretary, uh, medical billing, and uh, above the certified nurse assistant, which are foundational occupations. As you can see, we have the nursing pathway in the right side, and we have the more administrative pathway on the left side. And these um, will be very well positioned above the medical assistant, medical secretary, and billing and coding, as these skills are needed for a patient care coordinator. And let me just pause and clarify here, like that there is also a need for patient care coordinator at the RNBSN level in the acute care um, setting. However, we are primarily focusing on this in the non-clinical setting, in the ambulatory care. Based on the focus group, participants mentioned that this occupation could also be a great career pathway for medical scribes. Um, and uh, for certified nurse assistants, especially for those individuals that started as certified nurse assistants and they've been doing the job for five years and they just want to do something that's not so much uh, physically demanding or they're physically worn out. Um, as I described a little earlier, patient care coordinators serve as liaisons between the healthcare team, family members, and patients. And these are some subjects or or proposed course titles. They said that they needed them to understand and know what is public health and how the social determinants of health affect individuals accessing care. They wanted uh, patient care coordinators uh, to have some motivational interviewing skills, uh, know about chronic diseases management and chronic uh, conditions, understand the healthcare system, uh, know well communication and presentation skills and specifically focus in the cultural competency and patient advocacy skills. And uh, uh, they mentioned that not just understanding but also knowing how to really work and be aware of those different, um, uh, different skills. Um, the also mention of organizational skill, skills and computer skills. These are the um, knowledge, skills, and abilities that were brought up during the stakeholder interviews and focus groups. Due to timing, I will just let you read at your convenience. But if we can look at this, we can see that they brought up some skill sets that are useful across the board in any occupation, in any healthcare occupation which are communication skills, verbal, written, by, bilingual, if they can learn a different language, that will be great. Critical thinking, problem solving, medical terminology, billing and coding, ability to multitask. Um, and again, uh, having that sensitivity to the needs and situations of multicultural populations from a variety of income levels and be resourceful. Currently, we have six colleges that have close related programs for patient care coordinator. And recently, we made these recommendations. And these are the recommendations to, that we provided to our community colleges, which is to adopt, develop the patient care coordinator program 
to engage subject matter experts and faculty to assess current course content um, so we can align the curriculum to the KSAs from the employer engagement to modify, expand, and add courses to develop unknown credit options, especially for those colleges that to consider an online program to offer flexibility for incumbent workers. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time and see if you have questions and if we have time for questions, Heather, at this point. Yeah, I think we're going to save the questions um, till the end well, after Kirsten's presentation. But thank you, Connie, You're for welcome. that. Um, and if um, I can screen share back, that would be great. Thank you. All right. And with that, we'll, we will pull back up the PowerPoint. Thank you so much, Connie. Um, and if you do have questions, save those and we can get to questions at the end here. So next, we would like to introduce our uh, guest speaker from industry, which is Kirsten Canali. She is the Director of Talent Acquisition and Talent Development at Scripps Health. And she has had a long history um, in healthcare, um, quite a few years. Um, over 19 years, and she is going to share with you today her journey as well as her presentation. Kirsten, whenever you are ready, I'll pull up your slide here. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for having me. And Connie, I feel so honored to be following you today because your information is so relevant to what's happening out there in the community today. And I'll be able to touch a little bit on that for those educators that are out there. But first, I just want to share the words of Ellen, Ellen Browning Scripps. The most important and beautiful gift one human being can give another is in some way to make their life a little bit better to live. And I just want to recognize each of you out there as educators and administrators in our community uh, going out to make sure that we're connecting the people in our community with meaningful and rewarding careers. So thank you for all of the work uh, that you have done. And just like uh, we're talking a little bit about today, I wanted to talk to you about what does that journey look like? Because just like finding the person that you're gonna marry or selecting what major you're gonna have, finding a job or a career is a real life event. And we've all had the honor of, and to know somebody that has worked in the job that they love, right? Where it's cliche to say that you never work a day, but how did they get there? And I was so appreciative of Heather putting my path up here um, because my path started very early on and it actually started when I was in high school. It started uh, being getting involved with the ambassador club and working for a private school to say, I wanted to go out to other um, elementary schools and middle schools to be able to share with them about my experience about Maryville High School. And here I was, my father was a firefighter, my mother was an insurance claim agent, and no one in my family had ever gone to college before. Um, but it was something that was a dream for myself and something that people around me encouraged me that I should go for. So going to a college preparatory school was my dream. And then I got into a school where they only accepted 25 girls into a graduating class. And I could tell you that I was the only um, woman that had a blue collar family. So how did I assimilate into that culture and really have the courage to try new things? So I'm probably one of the very few people uh, that you meet that know that they wanted to get into recruitment at a very early age, but that was because of educators and experiences. Um, and then I had a job at Sizzler uh, starting to uh, wait tables and then moved on to Applebee's. And I'll share with you that I was a waitress that was one day asked, hey, would you work in the kitchen? And I said to them, of course, as long as you match the pay that I would be making in the front of the house and give me a new shirt because I'm not gonna be buying a new one. And that day at 18 years old as a female, I expedited the Friday kitchen. I was the only female working in the kitchen that day and I ran the whole shift. And I remember how exhilarating it was to, to use those new leadership skills. And the regional manager was there and told me that that was a test. And from that experience, they invited me to go on the road and be a corporate trainer uh, traveling the country. And I opened up 25 Applebee's along the East Coast uh, before I was even 21 years old. So I share that with you um, because by doing those experiences, um, that's how you find the passions that you have. And here I am 20 years later, uh, loving the work that I get to do uh, here in San Diego. 
So what we wanted to do today, Connie, Heather, and I, we wanted to talk a little bit about what is going on in this era of COVID hiring. And I wanted to share with you how impactful the work that you're doing is with your students. Back in March, when we first heard about the surges that were happening out in New York, we knew that we would be all competing for the same talent. But what we also saw is that our community raising their hand to say that they could be here for Scripps employees and Scripps patients if we were to have a surge. So what we did as an executive leadership team here at Scripps was really thought differently about how can we use different people in the right job to care for patients. So what we did is we went out to our schools and to talk about students. And what we did is we used students that were either in community college programs such as respiratory therapy or even some of the nursing programs. And because of Sherry Mencken's powerful network, we were able to attract hundreds of applicants within hours. And then what we did is we had all hands on deck of our recruiters that were completing virtual interviews and being able to make rapid offers based on the clinical competency as well as the behavioral attributes of those uh, students. And within seven days, we hired over 300 students to now become in their first job to work here at Scripps. And what an amazing experience to be working during a time of a pandemic. And what was really wonderful about those experiences for these now employees that are going through their program, some of them reached out to Sherry and said, you know, I really wanted to be a nurse one day, but then when I saw what it was like to work in these high acuity areas with death and dying, I don't know if this is the right specialty for me at anymore. So again, it just reinforces that these, through these experiences, you validate the choices that, you're, that you are making. And those students where the story continues and continues to be great, out of um, the students that we've hired, we've seen a large percentage of them convert from those entry level position now to those professional licensed positions. So that's exactly why we're all in this together to make sure that we're preparing those students to take those first jobs. So how do you prepare? Because frankly, not everyone was prepared. What we need your help to do is to help encourage the student populations that jobs are earned. Just by showing up is not enough. So one of the very first competencies I would encourage you to um, work with your students on is networking. And networking is, is saying hello to the security officer and introducing yourself when you park your car every day. It's saying good morning and introducing yourself to the screener that makes sure that you have the right temperature before you enter the hospital. It's seeing everyone and the value that they offer on the care team and telling them who you are and what your career goals are and asking them what advice do they have about you getting into a position at their desired employer. What do they wish that they would have known about this career 10 years later when they were a student? And by asking those questions and building a network, you'll find the path just like all of us did with those mentors and network that helped them get into a job. And that's going to be so important to be that continuous learner, which is another really important competency, and have that self-awareness to know exactly that you're accountable for your actions, that mistakes are going to happen, but you have to own them and learn from them. And if you can do that, you'll be ready for healthcare because we are evolving more rapid than we ever have. The change that we've experienced in the past seven months has actually been what it would take in organizations five to 10 years to do. So how can you help us prepare our students to be ready to be able to encounter those changes? One of those changes that have rapidly come is the way that we interview and select candidates. Um, gone are the days that you'll put on your suit and come in for a formal interview with a panel. Now what we're using is technology to be able to en enable the interview process. So we, what we wanted to do today, Connie and Heather thought it'd be great to give you guys a look under the hood of how we're making hiring decisions here at Scripps. And what we do now is that once you apply for a position, and I, I wanted to tie this back to what Connie was talking about, about the patient uh, coordinator position. We have a very similar track here at Scripps. The, the first position that you go into is the patient service representative. And that is going to be the entry level job that requires little to no experience, some customer service per se. But while you're in that job, you're gonna learn a key tool, a key skill, and that's the electronic medical record of Epic. 
So when you're interviewing for a position like that, or you're talking to a student, I'm talking about your seniors or your first years at your community college that are looking to get themselves into the healthcare environment, this is the way to do it through the patient service representative. You're doing check-in, check-out, you might be doing some scheduling, you're working on a care team and the electronic medical record. You're testing it. Is this a job that you want to go for? Um, and when you complete that application, the first step is if you meet the qualifications, you complete an on-demand interview. And on-demand means is that the interview is able to be completed when the candidate is ready to complete it. It asks about four questions around your connection to the mission, talks to you about your continuous improvement skills, your conflict resolution, and your teamwork and patient focus. And what I would like to do today is give you the tips on how to prepare your students for the, these interviews. They're flexible. You can take them from your phone. You can take them from uh, your desktop or laptop or iPad. And you can take them on your own time. We don't allow you to reshoot it. So what, I, what I'm saying to you is how do you prepare them to give a clear and concise answer that's about a minute to a minute and 10 seconds to really to be able to give a specific example that is recent and provides the result. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for somebody that is really able to tell that story of a recent example with a recent accent, action and result. And that's gonna really prioritize them in the pile of candidates that are applying for these entry level positions. Uh, from there, now you're in there and you're working as a PSR, but you're also raising your hand for stretch assignments. It ties back to that networking that I'm talking about. You wanna come in every day and say hello to the people around you. You wanna come in every day and say, what can I learn today? And when you leave, you wanna rehire yourself every day. So you wanna to say to yourself, thank you and goodbye to the people that you work with. And I know for sometimes for, not me, but maybe I have some introvert colleagues that I've worked with, They've never thought about that before, that connection in the beginning and the end of the day. But what I've also heard is that that's what makes a lasting impression. It's what gets you the meeting, it's what gets you that stretch assignment, it's what helps you go to the next level. And then here at Scripps, we have a similar role called the patient service specialist. This is gonna be that next step that Connie was talking about because it does require the Epic medical record experience as well as familiarity with the medical terminology DRG codes. So now you have this and you're running parallel paths with you while you're in the program. You can continue to rise through that administrative track that Connie was sharing with you to even a coordinator position. And that's for somebody that has no clinical skills. Over on the clinical side, Sherry and I are really excited to share with you that we're adding 30 brand new clinical document improvement specialist positions. These are really the puzzle solvers, the problem solvers that are looking at the chart to make sure that all the accurate information is in there. And one of the things I really recognize here at Scripps as being unique um, and valuable here and makes us a great place to work is that all 30 positions will be filled with internal employees. Those internal employees will be nurses from the bedside that are looking to move away from the bedside and strain their eyes rather than their back. In addition, they're going to get the value of being able to work from home. So again, this is how rapidly our environment is changing and we're looking at new jobs differently on how they can be done at the ultimate goal of being able to provide the highest level of patient care. And as you can hear from me, when you do the work that you love every day, there's really a reward with it. You get to meet great people like Heather and Connie. You get to learn with Sherry and continue to modernize our experiences. But that's what we're asking your help to do, to help connect those people with the right behavioral attributes and those goals of continuous learning and service that we can help you get them placed here at Scripps. I know that you're probably asking yourself, how can you work more with scripts? And I'm happy to take those questions differently uh, take them in a little bit, but I'm also able to say to you, with this new virtual world, I'm happy to connect with you differently. So if any of you by showing up today would like me to come and speak to one of your classes or connect them with different employees that are in the job to learn a little bit more, I'm happy to do that to support you and the community so that we can continue to work to get together to care for our community and keep us healthy. So I want to say thank you, Connie and Heather, for having me. And if there's any questions that you have uh, from the group, I'm open to answering those. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, 
what a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much. And, and for just your support for the community and for advancement, right, with our future workforce. Um, I, I did want to mention, Kirsten did offer to uh, come to your classes to, to talk to your students. If you're interested in that, please email me, um, heather.covasos at gccd.edu. I'll put that in the recap email as well, and I can help to schedule that. Um, and I'd be happy to help with that. So thank you, Kirsten. Um, yeah. So with this, we'll uh, jump right into our Q&A because we do have um, just a little bit of time here, about 15 minutes, which is great. Um, and if I could start, I, I do have a question. For those of you that like to ask a question, go ahead and put those in the chat. We'll get to those. But um, these questions can either be for Connie or Kirsten. I do have one question, though, that was um, from Brand, uh, Brendan Casey. He's an educator at Granite Hills High School. And Brendan asked, um, this is probably more for you, Kirsten. Um, have there been any projections made on the long-term changes in healthcare brought about by the pandemic? And if so, how are these projections impacting hiring decisions in the future, near and far? Sure. I think that, that when we think about the future, I, I will tell you that a, a day in healthcare today is what a month used to feel like. The types of things that are rapidly changing and the decisions that need to be made. Uh, the first thing is, is that working in a remote workforce, um, many of us, like myself, I'm here working from home, we have got picked up out of the office and we might not ever go back. And I think, you know, how can you prepare your students for that? Um, how can you prepare them to work very independently but stay connected virtually is a skill I know I probably wish I would have had as well as some of my colleagues. Um, another uh, big piece that we see uh, that is happening uh, differently is just new jobs are being created uh, to be able to uh, service patients in a different way. So another great job, especially for my high school educators out there, doesn't require anything um, but the high school diploma is the security officer. And before a security officer did not require a healthcare provider BLS card. Um, I would encourage all of you schools, if you can have a, a healthcare provider BLS course right in the high school, um, it would be a great um, asset to be able to give your students as a competitive advantage to be able to get positions into uh, the healthcare way. So now all of our security officers have that BLS card to be able to deal with critically ill patients at our screening stations. But we're gonna continue to evolve and I don't know what the future looks like um, outside of the next three months. Um, I know things will continue to change as we get to November as we get to January, and frankly, when we know a, a valid vaccine is here. Uh, Scripps has put together a panel of physicians that are reviewing every vaccine so that they can help guide us in the community when the right time and the right vaccine to, to, to receive. Thank you. More questions. Go ahead and enter them in the chat, or if you're brave enough to unmute yourself, you can do that too. Okay, we do have a question from Roberto Corona. Um, are there opportunities for high schools, for high school students to participate in internships or hands-on experiences? If not, are there alternative experiences? And boy, I would like to just chime in because I've worked with Sherry Mankin, um, a colleague of Kirsten's for uh, the past several years now on the HSEP program, which is the high school exploration program um, for students, uh, high school students to actually intern at Scripps, different, the five different locations in cohorts of five, so 25 students total over a five or six week long uh, summer internship program. Highly competitive, but there is an internship program for high school students that do exist. Unfortunately, due to COVID this, this summer, we did have to um, cancel the internship but um, hopefully that will resume as we move forward. Kirsten, if you want to add anything to that, sorry, I just wanted to jump in. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. We love our partnership with you on that, Heather. And I know Sherry, it's a program. It was heartbreaking for us to have to make that choice. But no, even as we decrease the number of student placements right now in the High School Explorer program, it's for the safety of our community and then uh, the number of PPE that we have available here in our community. But I would like to say, let's think differently and let's think differently together. Uh, our organization has challenged Sherry and I to think about how can we do these types of preceptorships or internships in a different way. And you as being the educational experts, we're looking at you to come to us with a plan for how that works. Additionally, 
I believe that not every student is um, meant to go to, to college or to a trade program. And I wanna get partnered with you sooner. So Sherry and I are also working with an FY21 as we go into the new fiscal year of how can we partner with strategic um, high schools to say how can we get in there and help be able to build those career tracks that I'm talking about today with Connie. You know, who are those students that can go into those entry level customer service roles learn the um, epic medical record, learn the different uh, insurance codes, and then grow that career path? Or do you start off and work in our EBS team and have a job that gives you pride, exceptional benefits, tuition reimbursement, scholarship opportunity, then to be able to enter the career track of becoming um, a nurse or a clinical path? Why can't an SPD, a sterile processing tech, be trained in your high schools rotating through our, uh, our organizations and graduate high school as SPD tech? This is where we need to be thinking differently because as Connie will share with you, the supply is so limited here in San Diego. We need to build that supply. We need to make our, or our community stronger uh, with these skills and financial stability. Thank you. Gosh, the f questions are flooding in Kirsten and Connie, so here they come. And we just have about nine minutes, so we do have some time, so keep them coming. I'm also getting emails from educators wanting you to come speak to their students, so thank you for those. Um, Catherine Whitaker, is there an online shadowing the students can participate in? And I can think that's what you were talking about, Kirsten, think differently, right? Online shadowing, is that an opportunity maybe down the road or that exists now? What is it? And I think that's kind of what we're asking you to do. Like, so when it's, it's, it sounds jazzy, but what do you, it is, what would be the expectation of what online shadowing could be? So what Catherine, what we're hoping that you can do is let's get into a dialogue about it so that we can talk about it. Do we have some online? Yes. At the highest level at some of our NP programs, but let's really think about what um, areas that you're interested in and how we can work together. Great, and I can help with that too, that communication and connection there. Um, Kate O'Connor, I think this is a, a comment that Kate is making. Um, she had five guest speakers so far and finding that people are way more amendable uh, to remote guest speaking, which makes sense, right? Campuses are difficult to navigate. I can, I can agree to that. It's hard to get on campuses. Um, it's hard to leave work. So she's thinking she'll stay, uh, still have guest speakers zoom in even while we're there back in school. And that's um, what my colleague and I, Monica, are finding too, that um, this remote guest speaker interaction has become, as we've worked out all the kinks, right, of the virtual platforms and things, it's actually becoming a little bit more accessible for students and speakers. So thank you for that comment, Kate. Uh, a question from Sue Simpson, is the patient care coordinator educational track a certificate or an associate degree? Uh, thank you, Sue, for your question. At this time, we are in the process of making the recommendations to the colleges. We're in the process of setting up some meetings for those colleges that are willing to pick up this program. And uh, they have the option to, to choose if that's going to be a certificate uh, or an associate degree. But it, right now, the way it's being proposed and the way um, it's being um, uh, where the patient care coordinator falls, it's pretty much going, probably going to be a certificate. Thank you, Connie. Connie, can I just throw in a quick word? We did a similar project in the LA region and the, um, the care coordinator, we, we had levels of, of care coordination and it was a certificate that was added on um, to CNAs, LVNs, RNs, and social workers, the people who already had a healthcare background and then we did the additional training. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Sherry. I, uh, like I mentioned during the presentation, there's also great need for RNs and BSNs to be care coordinators and that it's more at the um, acute care level. And definitely there's a great need for that. And it will be awesome to uh, model some of the work that you already have done it. Um, Sher Sherry is a regional director in Los Angeles. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Connie. Uh, Rosanna from Crestmont Union High School District also mentioned that they have a virtual health pathway internship with 40 students. Um, so Rosanna um, is on this call and um, she could also be a resource if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, another question from Brendan Casey at Granite Hills. Um, this question is for you, Connie. 
How have CTE programs over the last 10 years helped with current health care needs? Um, I guess we're looking for a vindication of what we are doing in a quantitative way. Uh, Brandon, thank you so much for your question. I'm sure we can provide you some quantitative the indication uh, via uh, working together with uh, Tina Novartel for the Centers of Excellence, but absolutely um, the healthcare, you know, the healthcare field continues to grow and there's a continue, continuous need for it. We are desperate right now for CNAs, for LVNs, we're desperate for, there's great need for uh, medical assistants, medical secretaries, and all those um, CT programs, you know, moving forward into the different career paths that there's a great need. And I'm more than happy to provide you with some quantitative um, data um, and I'll make a note. Thank you, Connie. And we just have one comment from Sylvia Cornejo. She's the Dean down at Southwestern uh, Higher Education, uh, the Otay Mesa campus. Um, and just mentioning a comment about the high school exploration program through Scripps is outstanding. Um, I believe she had her son go through that program and um, he did a great job. So thank you for that comment. Um, and yes, I will provide my email address and the recap email as well to be a resource for everyone to connect um, to Kirsten or if you have further questions. This will be just kind of, we're about 356. So if you have any more questions, now's the time to enter them in the chat or if you'd like to unmute yourself, you can ask. We probably have time for about one more question. I'll just pause for a second. As, as people are thinking on the next question, I also want to um, invite you. We want this to be also a platform for sharing successes or challenges that you might be encountering at your high school level, community college level. If there's anything that you learned from this pandemic or anything that has worked out for you, please feel free to share. And uh, th this was such an exciting um, session. I'm sorry we're running out of time, but I would love to hear what's going on in the classroom as well. Absolutely. And, um, you know, if you, for those of you on the line, all of our attendees, again, we have about 50 educators um, on the line. So if you'd like to, you know, have a session or a forum dedicated to that discussion, just let us know in the survey. Um, so I just want to thank Connie LaFuente uh, for, for your presentation today. And Kirsten Canali, thank you so much for joining us today and for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, so here is our next regional K-14 health sector discussion forum. It is planned for Thursday, November 19th. Again, same time, same place, Zoom. Um, and we will be sending out an invitation for that shortly if you'd like to attend. So get that on your calendar if you can. Um, and then also we have the survey that is uh, right here. I'll put the survey link in the chat, but this is just a brief survey what we've been talking about throughout the forum where you can give us your feedback on uh, what you'd like to discuss moving forward in the next forums. It'll take you no longer than five minutes to complete. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop this link into the chat. And if you could please complete this, that would be so helpful moving forward. So we make sure we cover the topics that interest you. And there's the survey. I'll also put that in the recap email as well for those of you that like to fill, uh, fill it out from there. So thank you so much with that. Um, this will conclude. We are right, just right about on time. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for joining us. And again, much appreciation to our presenters today. Thank you for your time and your expertise. And we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. It's always a joy to put these together. So, oh, and Kate's saying, yes, we're just, for those of you that want to hang on, we'll be on for a couple more minutes. Um, I actually am holding the photo in my <laughs> screen. It's so cute. Look at all these kids. Oh. They got to go. They, I, I can't even remember, to be honest, because I'm old and I can't remember anything anymore, but I think <laughs> it might have been multiple weeks that we went and um, my kids got to watch a surgery from like a gallery. Like they were so incredibly kind and generous with the opportunity. And um, they also had my students out for a, a many week internship, my uh, class of 2018. So I have so much appreciation for um, Scripps' commitment to 
uh, raising up healthcare professionals. And actually, I still talk to a lot of these kids, and a lot of them did go into healthcare. So it really does have an impact, even though we should probably have a more formalized reporting um, to get that quantitative data um, that Roberto wanted. But anyway, I just really have so much appreciation for everyone, the community college districts. I've gone to the Southwestern um, Day a bunch of times. That's amazing. Um, I just have a, I have a kid who did the surgery tech there who's trying to get into medical school right now. Um, so the work you guys do is so important and it matters so much. Yes, uh, Sherry Mason and his team is unbelievable. I to honor and privilege to work with her every day. She just chimed in there. She's sharing my link, but Sherry is the one who's saying she's so glad to have the kids with a great experience and hosting students. Uh, but I'll also say to you, data does matter. Um, and with Sherry and I re-looking at programs with uh, some new leadership that's really uh, supporting us, I, even that picture, as simple as like circling a couple, like copying it and circling a couple of faces. So do you say like they got jobs in the healthcare because of the work that we did? Uh, we're going to get even better at connecting it back to who gets jobs at Scripps. Um, what we're going to be doing is pipelining and tagging uh, those students, even if they're a sophomore. I want to know I met them to see, you know, how we're able to help um, get them jobs and make our community stronger. So let's just say this is Alvita Zay because we'll be talking to each other uh, very soon soon. This is not goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Kirsten. And Kate's at uh, Site Tech High. All right. Thank you <laughs> yes, so much. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And Kirsten, if you have to jump off for another meeting, I totally understand. Um, we're going to wrap up um, unless you have time, but we'll, we'll end this. We'll officially end the meeting. Thank you, Kate, for that. That was so sweet, that picture. That was <laughs> That's great. great. Yes. Fantastic. And thank you, Sherry, for joining, if you were able to join. I've been here. Thank you, Heather. Oh, good. Thank you for all your continued support, Sherry. Oh, you know, we love it. Yes. Thank well, you, Sherry. Right, right back at you. <laughs> <laughs> all righty, everyone. So this will conclude the meeting. And don't forget to um, fill survey. out that survey. And I'll send out a recap email shortly. So thank you for your time. And we went over just a little bit. It was for the good. That was a very heartwarming <laughs> message. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, thank Kate. You all. Thanks for thank sharing you. that. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, everyone.